Why don't we go ahead and start? It's it's according to the atomic clock on the wall over here. It's already seven thirty and thirty seconds. Uh, one of our Friday lunch guys mentioned that we should make one lunch a month, like a show and tell. Bring a kit, bring a radio, bring something, which I thought was a pretty good idea. So I think we're going to explore that. Um, coming up before our next meeting, we've got a uh, an outing at the park on the thirteenth, the thirteenth or twelfth. Have my calendar right here in front of me. On the twelfth, on May twelfth, which is Mother's Day, uh, another outing in the park at Brook Run, and I've already posted one announcement. And I'll pump some more out as we get closer. I like to do them like at two weeks and one week and then a couple days. Um, we will be doing power polls with this one because there's a couple of club members at radios that aren't ready to go on batteries or power supplies, and I told them I bring the kit and do power polls. So. There'll be at least two people want power poles. If you're curious about power poles, that would be a good one. And we've got a ham fest coming up, John. Ham fest. You're up. Yes, we do. June uh, June 1st, Saturday, June 1st coming up. So keep an ear out or an eye out for the volunteer sheet. Uh, we're still working to fill volunteer slots. Um, if you know of anybody that's talked about getting a table, uh, tell them to check the website and uh, there'll be a pay uh, pay feature on there that they can uh, go ahead and pay for tables or they can contact me one way or the other if they have questions. My contact information is at the top of the page on atlantahamfest.com and um, just looking to have a good time. So make sure it's on your calendars. Uh, the gates will open at eight o'clock on Saturday uh <clears throat> grand prize this year is a 7300 icom 7300 and if uh, you're looking to set up a table uh, indoors you can set up on friday uh, during the day from about 12 till 7 um and all this information like i said can be found on the website so um the volunteer sheet it's not on the website it's been going around the groups.io group so if you're interested in volunteering and and don't know quite what you want to volunteer for please do contact me and uh we'll get the list out and find you a spot there's all kinds of places that you can help uh on the day of the friday and the saturday of the ham fest so um just keep an eye out for that and like i said if you don't see it my contact information is on the front page of the ham fest uh website so you can contact me and we'll we'll get the volunteer guy to contact you and find a spot for you um that's about it for right now that I can think of. Anybody got any questions? Where is it? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Jim Miller Park, like we've been doing out there. And uh, I guess that's, uh, it's got a Marietta address, but it's, I guess, kind of hostile um, off of. Uh, um, it's easy to get to no matter how you get there. Yeah, you just basically take uh, from 75 uh, right above the the uh, perimeter there first exit windy hill and take it west about six miles turn right on austell i'm sorry left on austell road and then right on to callaway um if you miss it and stay on windy hill you'll kind of have to wave it as you go by because there's nowhere to get off there you'll have to double back and uh unless you know the area then you can double back from the back side but uh, uh jim miller park cobb county uh marietta austell um Whichever city you prefer to call it, it's in. Uh, it's more of a postal address than anything else. So, another thing to throw in here, um, you, the guys that know me, I see some people on the group here who don't know me, and there's some people on the recording who probably don't know me. But I probably go to twenty or twenty-five ham fests a year. I like ham fests, and I, and I particularly like the smaller ones. So I go to Orlando. I thought about going to Dayton this year. I may still do it. Never been to Dayton. But I tend to go to the smaller ham fests, the one like we have. And one of the things I've noticed since COVID is a lot of the smaller ham fests have just canceled. They just don't exist anymore. A lot of them are having problems with location. Uh, my favorite, one of my favorite ham fests up in Greenwood, South Carolina, has canceled two years in a row because the, at the last minute, the school where they use the auditorium for the, the ham fest the insurance requirements have increased or other restrictions have increased at the last minute and they've not been able to have the ham fest. 
and those ham fests that are still pumping along, the attendance is way down on all of them. Even Orlando seemed to be down this year. So this is an important ham fest with Atlanta Radio Club and Kinahoochee. Uh, it's the Atlanta Ham Fest. There's Stone Mountain and there's us. Uh, mm. It would be really important and it would be really nice if every member of the club, of both clubs, could come out to the Ham Fest and tell everybody, spread the word around, because you know, Ham Fests are hurting and we are too. And this is an important Ham Fest for us. It really is. We canceled last year because a couple of vendors dropped out at the last minute with no warning. We're looking at the numbers for the park. The park has gotten more expensive, so we need attendance in order to justify having a ham fest. So if you know anybody who would like to go to ham fest, make sure everybody knows about it, and let's get as many people to go to the ham fest as possible. We, we need to support it, and, and I don't know how else to put it beyond that. That's as simple as simple as it gets. This is the last meeting before the ham fest. I just, he's right, it's June the 1st, so our next meeting won't be until like the 5th. Uh, so keep that in mind. Come out to the ham fest. There'll be a boneyard. There'll be forums. There'll be all kinds of stuff going on. And if you can think of something that you can do to help, maybe you want to come put up a radio station and operate from the park, Poda style, we can we can make that happen somehow. Uh, not much beyond that. Uh, you've got the email for the executive board for me and John and uh, and also for the treasurer and everybody else. You've got the email addresses. If you can think of anything, email us. Uh, any suggestion is, is okay. Uh, do we have any other announcements coming up? Hamfest is a biggie. Uh, one, one other, one sure. other thing. One Hi, other John. thing on the Hamfest. Uh, if you're one way you can help is if you if you if you regularly check into a net somewhere, whether it's two meter, ten meter, whatever. Mention it. Uh, mention mention the Atlanta Hamfest and the date June first. And uh, like I said, it's easy to remember. AtlantaHamfest.com also. So do. Uh, do uh, remind people when you're on one of these nets to uh, just make a blurb about it, so uh, we can continue to get the word out. It's, it's easier when we when we uh, hit all the different spots we possibly can to advertise it. So there, also, there is one. also free VE testing. Oh yeah, VE testing that goes without saying. Even though I just let it go without saying, didn't it? Yeah. The... Free. Yeah, free free VE testing. <laughs> uh, one more thing I'm going to throw out real quick uh, and then we'll move on to the presentation I know some people don't like announcements early on but we need to get the announcements out so people know what's happening it appears as it stands at the moment that we are going to be re we're going to lose the bank tower downtown where the repeaters are situated probably by July of 2025 uh, there's been some negotiation going on about uh, the insurance rates and whatnot on the tower, and those those negotiations have gone about as far as they can go, and the bottom line is we're going to be priced off the tower. We're not being evicted. Uh, rather, I think it's time for us to start looking at another location. Downtown would be great somewhere in the Atlanta area, but I'm just getting the word out now so people will know that it's pretty clear that we're going to lose the bank tower repeater site by July of 2025. We're going to carry it through at least that far to get at least through the Peachtree Road race next year and, and Hamfest next year. So if y'all can think of any place downtown, if you have any contacts of people with a rooftop or a tower or something near downtown or e just inside the perimeter, uh, be sure and let one of us know. We, we're going to start actively looking for uh, a new location and I'm going to be working with the repeater team and bring some other folks into that here next week or so just to see if there's anything we can do. But it seems pretty obvious July 2025 is, is we're going to have to relocate. We just can't afford to pay the kind of insurance that we need to pay to stay up there. That's kind of a downer note, but it could be a good could be a good thing. We could end up with two receivers instead of one. You never can tell. Uh, any, would, any other announcements? We've been on the bank towers uh, almost 30 years. Uh, just yeah, yeah 30 years a long time it's it's and, and again we're not being evicted it's just that the business requirements on the tower have changed and the insurance has changed and the insurance is prohibitively expensive that's the way i would put it and john has done a fantastic job of negotiating and dealing with these people he's been working with them for three years 
Um, but there's only so much blood you can squeeze out of a rock. And I think we squeezed, I think we squeezed the rock about, I think John is squeezed it about as hard as you can squeeze it. So time, time for us to start looking at the future and figure out what we, what we need to do. All right. Any other announcements? And then, uh, okay, Rob, take it over and, uh, do your thing. Go Rob. Oh, sorry. I was I was mute. 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 Yeah. Um, we've got another great program in our series of great programs. We decided instead of just having regular programs, we're going to have great programs. And our in our series of great programs, we have another great speaker on a uh, on a subject that's close to my heart or something close to my brain that uh, I really want to hear about. And uh, I found an expert on it. And and you're he is from he's not from the south. So you guys may not believe him, but I, but he's from the north, so that means I give him more credit. So, and uh, without <laughs> without further ado, um, Doug Grant, the uh, uh, K1 DG, DG Doug Grant, um, and he's got some great slides, and I, I'm, I can't wait. So, uh, take it away, Doug. Hi. Okay. Thank you, and uh, good evening, everybody, and uh, thanks for. Uh inviting a Yankee boy named Grant even to uh, talk to all you rebels down there. Hope there's no hard feelings about the war. Now, Sherman's the only name we have problems with. <laughs> okay. All right. Let me see if I can get this thing started and share my screen. It says the host disabled participant screen sharing. So whoever the host is, can you enable me for screen sharing, please? Try to get, try it again. I don't know why it does that. <clears throat> there we go. And let's go to that hmm, says so share. There we go. And let me go into slideshow mode. There we go. Now let me move you guys out of the way. Okay. So uh, you, you can see everything okay. We're good. We're good. All right. So I'm going to talk about Moonbots tonight. Uh, A.K.A. E.M.E. Earth stands for Earth, Moon, Earth. Another title for this presentation might be What's a nice HF contester DXer doing on a crazy band and mode like this? Um, for background, um, I first got licensed when I was 13, uh, um, which was in 1967. And uh, I was looking around for what parts of ham radio I wanted to get involved in. And I got my subscription to QST. And in January 1967, I saw this thing um, about uh, guys, a guy in Australia working a guy in New Jersey on two meters. And I didn't know too much about propagation, but I knew the two meters was basically a local band. This was even before FM was a thing and your repeater wasn't on the bank building. Uh, there were, there really wasn't anything, hands doing anything on two meters except uh, 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 a little bit of uh, terrestrial DXing, trying to get tropo openings and local nets on two meter AM, and that was about it. And this guy in Australia worked someone in New Jersey on two meters, and that had to be the coolest thing. And I figured someday I would do that. But there was no way I was going to be a VHF -er when I was 13. Uh, I looked in QST, and serious VHFers had equipment that looked more like plumbing than like electronics. Uh, they had fancy homebrew low noise amplifiers. They had transverters, whatever those were. They had crazy antennas. And the more I looked at that side of ham radio, uh, I decided as a kid, nope, that was not for me. Give me some wires and beams and uh, HF, especially contesting. And I get into that and uh, did that for the first uh, 40 some years of ham radio. And I got pretty good at doing the HF contesting. And uh, if you Google my call sign, you'll see that it uh, very often shows up in contest results. So here are some of the crazy antennas that guys are using these days currently on uh, moon bounce. Uh, I2FAK in Italy has an array of 16 19 element Yaggies. And that whole array can be uh, turned side to side for azimuth. And it can also be tipped up to point up at the moon. So it's got full elevation control. W7GJ has an array of 16, 17 element Yagis. 
on two meters and four nine element Yagis on six meters. HB9Q is a group in Switzerland that has a 50 foot dish uh, and they don't just illuminate it with a little patch or a dipole. They actually light it up with uh, four element Yagis on uh, two meters and 432 um, for, uh, with uh, those elements having horizontal and vertical polarization capability. This is the biggest EME antenna out there in the amateur category. A DL7 APV, who just became a silent key about uh, two or three weeks ago, built this array of 128 11 element Yagis for 432. Uh, it's got 33 dB of gain, uh, very narrow bandwidth, so it's got to be pointed right at the moon. Um, and he's, uh, he built that thing over the course of about 10 years. And if you Google his uh, website, DL7 Alpha Papa Victor, uh, you can see the, uh, the uh, 10 years it took him to construct the array. Uh, you can imagine what the rotator is uh, in that picture. You can see him, he's sitting on the rotator. The biggest antenna I know of that was ever used for EME um, was the Arecibo dish in Puerto Rico. Uh, that uh, antenna is now kaput. Uh, it collapsed a few years ago. One of the support towers went down and uh, uh, everything went down with it. And sadly, it's not going to be rebuilt. No one wants to pay for it. Um, but at uh, 70 centimeters, the 432 megahertz band, it had 56 dB of gain. And uh, WD5AGO did a classroom demonstration uh, demonstration that yielded speaker copy signals on homebrew three foot long Yagis. Uh, and that was with the uh, guys in Puerto Rico only transmitting with 35 watts to 50, uh, 56 dB of gain. So those are some of the big antennas, but you don't need antennas that big to work at EME. At the other extreme, uh, the DL7 APV with that big array of 128 Yagis worked a guy who was using just uh, 60 watts to a dipole on 432. Um, W7GJ on six meter moon bounce worked this guy, W8WTS, who put a five element Cushcraft beam on a little mast in his, uh, in his driveway uh, during the winter in Cleveland uh, and only 300 watts. So you don't need a mega station to work EME uh, as long as the other guys got something to do the work. So when I started on two meters um, about uh, six or seven years ago now, uh, EME was not my primary goal. What I really wanted to do was to chase the Brendan Trophy, um, which was first offered in about 1995. It's for the first America to Europe terrestrial QSO on two meters. And it still hasn't been claimed. No one's, uh, no one's been able to do it. Uh, the rules don't allow you to use uh, the moon or a satellite. Um, a group thought they had made it a few years ago, but it turned out that the ISS uh, the International Space Station happened to be right between Canada and England at the time their signal was copied. Um, and by doing a lot of analysis of the Doppler shift and all that, they determined that that was the mechanism for the, uh, for the communications. And uh, that's also not allowed for the Brendan Award. So you have to use some kind of terrestrial mode like meteor scatter or uh, tropospheric ducting or multi-hop sporadic E. Uh, which is very, very, very rare. That's why the Brendan Trophy still hasn't been claimed. And some friends of mine said, well, you've got a place up in Maine. Uh, I have a summer house on an island just off the coast of Maine. And they said, well, you're, you're closer than anybody else in the US to Europe. Why don't you go after the Brendan? And I thought that was a pretty cool thing. The station requirements are similar to what you need for EME. You need a high power amplifier. You need a very good receiver. The antenna requirements are a little bit different, but I figured I would start using EME for practice to get used to using the digital modes and get used to operating on two meters. Uh, but then I kind of got hooked on, on EME and that's uh, what I'm gonna talk about tonight. Now the path loss from the earth to the moon and back is somewhere around 250 dB on two meters. Uh, that means the signal power that comes back is, uh, and if I did this correctly, it's one ten millionth of one billionth of one billionth of the transmitter power. So that means you need to put up a lot of power put up a lot of antenna gain to get as much effective radiated power as you can. And then a very sensitive receiver also with a lot of antenna gain at that end. Uh, CW moon bounce contacts are possible for very equip well-equipped stations. Uh, SSB QSOs are extremely difficult on EME, um, especially on two meters. And we'll talk about that in a little while. So if the traditional modes like CW and uh, sideband are difficult, 
um, how do we do it easily for mortals? Uh, K1JT invented uh, a whole suite of communication modes, digital communication modes that allow modest stations to make EME contacts and allow very, very small stations using FT8, which maybe some of you have used, uh, to make contacts around the world on HF. For two meters, if you've got a two meter SSB transceiver with 100 watts of output and a good antenna, nine elements as a minimum, uh, 11 or 13 is fine. Those are fairly modest size antennas. Uh, a short low loss feed line uh, and a PC that can run the WSJTX software and a sound card. Uh, you've got everything you need for your station. Uh, the operator needs to have patience. Uh, moon bounce is not uh, an easy thing to do and it'll, use, it'll probably take you a few tries to get it right. If you look on YouTube, if you Google uh, K1JT EME contact, uh, you can see um, the actual progress of a moon bounce contact done at the K1JT station with W2DBL running it. I like this particular picture. It's a screen grab from that YouTube, but over on the right, you see a big box with uh, two uh, square meters on it and below it, a, a slightly smaller black box uh, with one meter on it. That's K1JT's 8877 two meter amplifier that he used uh, when he was developing the WSJTX uh, software and the uh, moon bounce modes. And I happen to have that, that, P, that uh, power amplifier in my shack now. Uh, he was selling it a few years ago. I got news of it, so I bought it. So I now have K1JT's old amplifier. I think that's really cool to have something that was once owned by a Nobel Prize winner. And every time I use it, I feel like I get a little bit smarter. So if you've worked FT8 on HF, uh, here's a comparison between the FT8 mode used for HF and uh, JT65 and Q65, which are used for moon bounce. Um, and uh, you can see the differences. The sequence period is longer for the moon bounce modes. They use more signaling tones than FT8. Uh, transmit period is longer, but the typical signal range that can be detected is a lot wider, um, especially at the bottom end. Uh, with Q65, you can detect signals that are down to minus 33 dB, as opposed to FT8, where minus 24 is about the end of, end of the line. If you're familiar with what the waterfall display looks like on FT8 in a voice channel, you can see that uh, at the top there, it's, it's a lot more colorful. You can see about 30 stations having QSOs um, across that band. On JT65, there's usually only one station per channel and the trace is a lot skinnier looking. Uh, it's uh, that very, very narrow, uh, very faint uh, white trace uh, that's uh, circled by that uh, yellow oval on the right. That's the waterfall display on uh, JT65. Now you can see that uh, I'm copying a signal there. Uh, I'm being called there by G4TRA. And I'm gonna talk about him in a little while. He's sort of the poster boy for small, sta small station uh, moon bots. Here's what a strong JT65B signal looks like. Uh, you can see the sync tone, which is the bright one in the middle, and then all the little uh, speckles uh, going off to the right are the data tones, uh, all 65 of them. And there are such things as pileups on uh, off the moon. Uh, this is a shot I took a few years ago uh, with about 12 or 15 stations calling VP2 EMB on Anguilla, um, which was a de-expedition there. And you can see the bright uh, uh, sync tones, a whole bunch of them, and then the uh, data tones uh, sort of scattered around. So my first moon bounce contact uh, came when I was up at my place in Maine. I was looking around for some sporadic EU one summer evening and there was nothing happening. And on the six meter chat room on the internet, W7GJ said he was gonna be firing up on EME on 50.190. And I had been out a few minutes earlier and I saw the moon was starting, was headed towards the west and was uh, almost setting. So I figured, well, what the heck, I've got nothing to lose. I dialed the receiver there. I plugged the headphone output directly into the PC mic input, messed around with the volume control a little bit. And I pointed my four element step IR towards the setting moon and didn't see anything for a little while. Then out of the corner of my eye, I saw CQW7GJDN27 pop up on the screen. And the software said that it was seeing a 2.4 second uh, uh, time delay. So that told me the signal was coming from the moon and wasn't sporadic E. So I uh, 
I dropped a note out to W7GJ and said, hey, I copied you, but well, if I can figure out how to transmit, maybe we can have a SCED tomorrow. And uh, he was very happy to try. And the next day, um, I connected the PC output directly to the microphone input of the radio, turned the gain down a little bit. And uh, on the first call, uh, made my first moon bounce contact. And then I was hooked. So if you want to start out on EME, um, what bands should you use? Well, it turns out there's EME activity on all bands from uh, 50 megahertz up to and beyond 10 gigahertz. Now on six meters, EME antennas can be pretty big. So there's a kind of a limited pool of QSO partners with big stations to be on the other side. 1296 and up requires some technical skill and a dish antenna. Uh, this guy, uh, W2HRO, doing business as Sublunar Systems, selling very lightweight fab uh, metalized fabric dishes that uh, you can put up in a day if you've got a reasonable amount for it. He also sells rotators that'll uh, do the azimuth and elevation. Uh, the sweet spot really is uh, uh, two meters, 432, and 1296. Um, those have the most activity. The antennas are reasonably sized. The equipment is readily available. Uh, you probably have something suitable already. So if you wanted to give it a shot, uh, pick out the band that you have the best equipment for. In my case, two meters was what I was planning on doing for the Brendan. So I had focused on uh, building a two meter station. So that's, uh, that's what I started doing. So the way you make your first moon bounce contact, get everything ready, make sure you have a clear shot at the moon. It, you know, Make sure you don't live between two tall buildings and uh, can't actually see the moon visually. If you can't see it, then the antenna can't see it. Uh, you want to test your receiver and antenna using a distant beacon, um, uh, you know, or a, a repeater that's far away. Make sure that uh, the receiver can hear it and the antenna is pointed in the right direction. Verify the, uh, the, the positioning. Um, pick a day when moon bounce conditions are good. Be there at moonrise or moonset, whichever is good for you. From the east coast of the U.S., moonrise is good because there's a lot more activity in Europe um, so that uh, they still have the moon uh, up at their locations and they can still see it when the moon is coming up here. There's a website called livecq.eu and you can find the big stations that may be active and then you can ask them for a sched. Now, I said good moon conditions. So what does that mean? You know, you, you would think that the moon is just a big, a big thing up there that you bounce the signal off and um, it's not like uh, uh, like HF or uh, or six meters waiting for sporadic E to happen. Uh, well, it turns out that the moon's orbit is not perfectly circular. It's slightly elliptical and it's tilted relative to the Earth's orbit. The variation in the distance from Earth results in a two dB difference in the path loss, and every dB counts on two meters uh, trying to do moon bounce. So conditions are very predictably better when the moon is closer. Uh, once a month, it's a little bit closer. Um, the azimuth and the maximum elevation vary throughout the month. Conditions are bad when the moon is in the same direction as the sun or the Milky Way. Uh, there are certain constellations out there that are very big noise sources and guys with really, really big antennas uh, hear a lot of noise and might not hear your weak signal if you're just setting up the first time. At moonrise and moonset, your antenna benefits from ground gain uh, of about 6 dB. So uh, right at moonrise and moonset, uh, as you uh, see the, uh, the moon going up through your antenna pattern, uh, you'll see a peak in your signal. And there's a website that shows the days of good conditions and bad conditions. And most of the serious moon bounce operators with uh, big stations looking for new guys to work because they work pretty much all, everybody who's active, uh, they, they're always looking for new guys. So they focus on the good days where the smaller stations have the best shot. So if you go to MMM on VHF, which stands for make more miles on vhf.de. It's run by a German guy. Um, and hit the propagation tab uh, and go to EME conditions. You get something that looks like this. So this vertical uh, black line is that day. Um, the red line is the path loss. And you can see there's a big peak. That happens to be when the moon is uh, looking at one of those noisy constellations. Um, and uh, the yellow line is the moon distance from the Earth. So here's where the moon is close. So that happens to be pretty good conditions on, the, on that particular day. Uh, over on these days, it would be very bad. On these days, it wouldn't be quite as good as uh, it is down here. 
So there are some strange things about moon bounce propagation that I learned over the years. Uh, there's a thing called Doppler shift. And uh, you've, you've heard Doppler shift without maybe knowing what it is uh, at audio frequencies. Um, if you uh, listen to a train going past, if you're stuck at a, uh, a railroad crossing, as the train gets closer to you, the pitch of the train's engine get, gets, uh, gets uh, higher in pitch. And then as it goes away from you, it goes lower in pitch. So you get that kind of, uh, kind of tone. I guess the same thing happens at a NASCAR race as a car goes around. It goes around the track. And it turns out that bouncing your signal off a moving object changes its, its observed frequency. And it's the craziest thing. On two meters, uh, you send your signal up on a particular frequency, and at moonrise, it comes back 300 hertz higher than where you sent it. Um, at moonset, it comes out about 300 hertz lower than uh, where you transmitted it. And uh, when the moon's directly overhead, it comes back at exactly the same frequency you sent up. Crazy thing. It changes signals uh, just by bouncing it off the moon. Uh, there's a thing called polarization shift. Uh, spatial polarization shift is very predictable because it's a geometric thing, uh, where station A can transmit on a horizontally polarized antenna, but the signal arrives at station B with vertical polarization. So that's predictable. That's just geometry. But then there's another effect. Uh, there's a thing called Faraday rotation, where as a signal goes through the Earth's magnetic field, it changes polarization from horizontal to vertical or vice versa. And that can be very frustrating. So here's the one that's predictable, spatial polarization. If the station A is transmitting, sends his signal with his horizontal antennas at the moon, they actually, when they come down and hit station B, it looks like a vertically polarized signal. Station C sees a signal sort of halfway between horizontal and vertical. And what's really weird about it is you can be trying to work a guy who's got horizontal polarization and you may not hear him and he may not hear you or you'll hear him, but he won't hear you. Uh, so one way skip is a real thing on moon bounce and the Faraday rotation can change the polarization to shift um, and it's not predictable and it changes uh, over minutes to hours. So it'll drive you nuts. So for target practice, if you want to test out your receiving capability, the French government built a very, a very nice uh, signal source for us. It's called GRAVES, which stands for Grand Réseau uh, something, something, something. And it's a big radar network for tracking space junk and uh, satellites that uh, um, are not documented. Um, it operates just outside the two meter band. So your two meter antenna will probably still have enough gain to hear it. It runs a few kilowatts to a giant antenna array in the grid square JN27. And the receive site is about 350 kilometers south of there. Um, and when the moon is between 15 and 45 degrees of elevation, uh, you can see the echoes coming back from the moon. It's a very, very useful beacon to test receiver and antenna. So once you've verified that everything's working, you listen for the big stations, signal reports are in DB. Uh, look on state, look on the, the live CQ EU website for stations that are minus 10 to minus 20 dB. Those are the big guns. If you can see them and then uh, tune them in and decode them, uh, get on a chat room and ask them if they'll be, if they're willing to listen for you for a sked. And uh, uh, 999 times out of a thousand, the answer will be yes, because all the big guys are looking for new guys. There's a chat room on N0 UK's website. There's a room for 144 and another room for 432. And you just sign up and uh, post a note and there you go. Here's what the live CQ website looks like. It's kind of like the skimmer or um, PSK reporter, but it's just for two meters and uh, has also a page for 432 and one for 1296. And what it reports is the frequency and the date, the time, signal strength, the differential frequency, differential time, you'll see that they're all between two and three seconds, which um, 2.4 would be of guys who have their clocks perfectly synchronized. Some guys are a little off, so they look like 2.2 or 2.9. But you can see the signals here um, uh, right now. And in this one, UT9UR at minus 15 is the big guy. Uh, SK5AA at minus 18 would another be, would be another good target, DF9YF, being heard pretty well. So those are guys that you would send a note to on the chat room and uh, ask them to go. Now, unlike FT8 on HF, uh, JT65B uses shorthand signals that were derived from CW moon bounce. 
The standard report is O, or, and it was always repeated when it was done on CW moon bounce. So in JT65B, the report is O, O, O. Um, what they used to do, they had what they call the TMO uh, reporting scheme, where T, I think, meant I heard something. M meant uh, I'm copying a call sign. O means I copied both call signs. Then the response is R, meaning I heard your O's and here's O right back at you. And then the next part of the exchange would be a confirmation of RRR. I copy the O that you sent me. And then usually a 73 gets uh, tacked on the end as a courtesy. The shorthand signals are two tones, so you can actually see them on the waterfall as well as decode them with the software. Q65A actually doesn't use the shorthand, it uses FT8 style reports of dB of signal to noise ratio. And you enable those, uh, the instructions are here if you wanna look at it at some point uh, and uh, click the shorthand box and decode after EME delay and uh, set the VFO to the frequency you want and set the transmit frequency where you're supposed to and let her rip. And this is what the, you would normally see on the screen using uh, WSJTX software. Um, in this particular sequence, uh, RX1AS calls CQ, IK4WLV answers him. Uh, RX1AS responds to him and sends his grid square and OOO. The IK4 responds with RO, which is uh, done in the shorthand uh, methods here. And then RRR from IK4WLV uh, in, uh, also in shorthand. And you can see the two tones that are separated there. So when I started doing EME, um, a good friend of mine who uh, uh, was very active uh, uh, many years ago, K1WHS, had an array of 24 13 element Cushcraft Yaggies and he had taken that down. Um, and when I told him I was starting to get interested, he said, well, here, I'll give you four Yaggies to start. Uh, you'll have to build an H-frame and figure out what to put it on. Uh, so I did that. Um, I uh, scrounged a, a surplus uh, TV transmitter board. Those were uh, um, uh, became available over the last uh, 10 years or so. Um, and uh, I modif it was modified for two meters. I added some control circuits uh, uh, to turn the bias on and off and to turn the relays on and off and so forth. Uh, power supply for uh, a kilowatt amplifier of uh, uh, made out of transistors. Um, the power supplies are very cheap. There are a lot of them on eBay. It's about 30 bucks to buy a, a, a three kilowatt power supply that's 50, 50 volts and almost 60 amps. Um, I had a TS590 I wasn't using and I got a used uh, Down East microwave transverter. Um, someone uh, gave me a, a gas fed preamp that they'd gotten from an estate. It's not the best in the world, but it's pretty good. It was uh, state of the art in 1990. Um, by 2010, it was no longer state of the art, but it was acceptable. Um, a friend of mine who had been doing satellite, uh, uh, two meter and uh, 432 satellite stuff had an azimuth elevation rotator that he wasn't using. So I got that pretty cheap. I used a mid range Dell laptop, no real, uh, you know, uh, high horsepower type of uh, computer to, to get the thing going. Over time, I replaced those Cushcraft antennas with uh, Innov antennas uh, cross-polarized. It had both horizontal and vertical elements. Um, the transverter wasn't very stable. People always complained about my signal drifting, so I uh, uh, bought a little GPS disciplined oscillator to uh, uh, make it more stable. I added more cooling to the Larkan amp, but I found that uh, Moonbots is tough on equipment. I've uh, blown up several preamps. Uh, flea market end connectors are not really good enough on two meters to handle a kilowatt. Um, I had a Daiwa watt meter, which was specified from uh, 1.8 to 144 megahertz and uh, one and a half kilowatts maximum. I found out that it wouldn't handle both 144 megahertz and a kilowatt at the same time. Uh, so that thing burned up. Uh, I've been through a few rotators. I blew up FETs in the amplifiers, the capacitors and low pass filters. It was, it's tough. Um, and I was using it at first at my summer house up in Maine and I moved it to, uh, in 2018, I moved it to, uh, my uh, New Hampshire year-round QTH when uh, we moved. A quick question. Yes, sir. Uh, what's the role of the transverter or, or are you getting to it in, in the setup? Um, let's see, can I go back? How do I go back here? Um, I do, guess I do it that way. Uh, the transverter, um, 
was uh, uh, transverted between 144 and 28 megahertz. So the TS590 sat there on uh, 28 megahertz and uh, the output from the transverter, the input of the transverter came from the antenna on two meters. It uh, went through the transverter, which down converted it from 144 to 28. And uh, it also had a transmit path so that I transmitted on uh, the TS590 on 28 and the uh, transverter moved it from 28 up to 144 megahertz with about 20 or 30 watts. That was enough to uh, uh, drive the uh, transmitter, the uh, tr TV transmitter board that had been converted to be an amplifier. So that's what it does. It's a uh, transceiving converter uh, between uh, VHF and uh, HF. And the reason you did that was because you were using a, an HF radio because you couldn't find a two meter with the power you were looking for. Is that is that why? Yeah, I didn't have a two meter rig, uh, two meter uh, sideband rig. So uh, I had the TS five ninety and uh, uh, the uh, transverter um, uh, fell into my hands fairly cheap. So that was that was the easiest way to do it. I started out with all used stuff, used antennas, used transmit, used amplifier board. Um, a used radio, uh, used transverter, used preamp, used, everything was used. So I probably put, I don't know, I probably put, um, I don't know, between, and I already had the laptop. So I probably put uh, about seven or 800 bucks into this uh, to get started. And with that setup, I worked my first uh, four or 500 uh, uh, guys on two meter moon bounce. So it was a pretty good start. Thank you. Okay, um, what I'm using now and have been for the last couple of years uh, on transmit, I actually did buy a radio that was a two meter radio. Um, I bought a, a, a TS2000, a fairly old radio, um, but it's uh, stable enough on two meters and puts out uh, plenty of power. I bought that K1JT 8877 amplifier and uh, a sequencer uh, from W6PQL. What the sequencer does is it handles the switching so that you disconnect the preamp from the antenna uh, so you don't blow it up when you transmit. And it uh, turns all the relays on in the right order um, before you start transmitting. And then when you go back to receive, it disables everything and puts it, uh, the preamp back in line. So it was a little relay box I had to build up uh, or you can buy them. Oh, my receive path is uh, the same TS2000, uh, but I put a uh, very nice uh, preamp uh, by advanced receiver research, um, which is uh, not real expensive. I think it's about a hundred bucks. I put that up on the tower. That lets me use, uh, um, or it gets uh, rid of some of the problems from feed line loss. Um, turns out on uh, two meters, when you're working with real, real small signals, um, feed line loss is a big deal. Even good feed line like LMR 400, um, 100 feet of LMR 400 is, uh, um, kind of a disaster for uh, for loss. Um, you really can't tolerate it. So a preamp in front of it uh, makes a big difference. <clears throat> I've also been playing around with one of these little USB sticks uh, called a FunCube Dongle Pro Plus. And that allows you, if you set it up with a faster PC, to decode all the signals across the two meter move mouse band. Um, and it can uh, you can see all the activity on the band at the same time. Uh, and that's uh, that's useful in contests, especially. Uh, and yes, there are moon bounce contests. There are about four or five of them a year. The antenna system has also evolved. I've got four uh, M squared, two M28 XPs. That's a 14 element Yagi horizontal and also 14 elements vertical on a 34 foot boom. Uh, they're spaced 16 feet apart, both horizontal and vertical. Um, the feed line on transmit is seven eighths inch heliax to try and minimize, minimize the loss. On receive after the preamp, I can use the uh, DX Engineering LMR 400 equivalent um, because once uh, once you're after the preamp, the feed line loss really doesn't matter very much. It's uh, swallowed up by the uh, gain of the preamp. The uh, rotators have also um, evolved. The uh, <clears throat> I use the an M squared Orion 2800, which I scrounged uh, used for azimuth because it's a pretty big array, um, and the elevation rotator was a uh, also, uh, the big M squared, uh, if you buy one of those new, it's uh, several thousand dollars, but I was given one uh, that had been uh, left out to die. Um, when I got it, it was completely rusted solid. And it took me a couple of weeks of evenings 
um, probably a gallon of PB blaster and WD-40, a lot of elbow grease, a lot of sandpaper, a lot of filing uh, to restore it to uh, working function. I use green heron controllers because uh, they'll control any kind of a rotator and they're, uh, you can inter interface them to the computer and the software so that they will track the moon automatically. I don't do that. I, I find I only have to uh, move the antenna about every five or 10 minutes. And it gives me something to do because frankly, making QSOs on moon bounce is uh, uh, like uh, watching paint dry, but without the uh, urgency and excitement. So one day I was in the backyard and uh, said, oh, look, the antennas, uh, the, the moon is up. Uh, if I turn the antenna a little bit, I can get one of those nice pictures of my moon bounce array pointing at the moon. So there it is. And you can see that's an aluminum tower cross boom. Uh, the, the, uh, it's two sections, uh, um, two full size sections and uh, one section is sunk in the ground of Rhone 55. Um, so that's freestanding. You don't really need a tall tower to do moon bounce. There are guys who do it with a tripod in their backyard. Um, um, you, you just, in fact, it's a kind of a disadvantage to have the antenna up very high because you hear a lot more noise sources that way. So what have I accomplished on moon bounce? Um, in the uh, six or seven years I've been doing it now, um, I've worked over 700 initials or different stations on uh, the digital modes. I've worked four on CW. I have not even heard any on sideband. And that's with a four times 14 element array. So, you know, it, it tells you that uh, doing a sideband uh, moon bounce on two meters is extremely challenging. Um, I finished worked all states uh, earlier this year. Um, I now have 90 DXCC countries worked. Um, I have uh, one contact on, uh, on six meters uh, off the moon on, uh, from Maine and one from New Hampshire, both with W7GJ, who was kind enough to sked me. The smallest station I've worked is a guy running nine elements and 400 watts. Uh, the smallest station I copied was E51WL out in the Pacific at his moonrise. I decoded him. He was running nine elements on 100 watts, but he couldn't quite hear me. So we didn't get that far. So I'm going to try and play an audio clip here. I don't know if that will come through. I'm not sure if there's another button I have to click to share the audio, but let's try it. Um, if you've got really good ears, see if you can hear the two call signs that are played in this, uh, this audio clip. Um, let's see if it comes through. Hang on. There we go. All right, did that audio come through okay? Did anybody copy a call sign? <laughs> I heard a little bit of noise at the beginning, but then nothing for the rest of it. Yeah, it was a burst of static, and then it was quiet. Well, the burst of static uh, lasted, the whole thing should have lasted about uh, 30 seconds or so. Um, maybe not quite that long, about 25 seconds. Um, and uh, a lot of static and then a little bit of CW. Um, and that was I2FAK with that array of 16 nine element Yagis uh, calling me. Uh, so my call sign was first and then I2FAK was the next call sign on it. Um, so that's how weak signals are even with uh, pretty big stations at each end. Um, I have a friend across town who's kind of my moon bounce mentor, uh, K1CA, uh, he's got uh, uh, closing in on, uh, uh, well, he's well well over 100 countries. He's closing in on 200, I think, off the moon. And most of those were done on CW before the digital modes were even invented. But he's been doing it for 50 years. And I have great respect for guys who made uh, 100 countries off the moon on uh, CW. Okay. So um, I've worked some cool DX on uh, on moon bounce, and I thought I'd show you some of the, some of the stuff you can work. Um, I've always thought call signs to start with numbers are cool. Uh, so here's a whole bunch of number call signs that I've worked uh, all on moon bounce. Um, 3DA0 and uh, 7P8 were uh, expeditions. The other ones are fixed stations. 
including the uh, 4Z5 guy in uh, Israel. Uh, he's in downtown Tel Aviv with a lot of noise around him, but he's very active and uh, works a bunch of guys. Africa is always an interesting place to try and work. Um, some of these were um, the expeditions. Um, some of them were fixed stations. Uh, BA4SI down there in China was kind of a cool one to work. Um, I worked him both uh, over the over my moonrise direction and at my moonset direction because when the moon is uh, furthest north in its travel, uh, you can see him in both both directions. So I was able to work him on both paths. Um, here's some more interesting ones. Um, uh, UN9L in Kazakhstan was an interesting contact. I was uh, tuning uh, on uh, uh, on the EME band and I was looking at a particular frequency, I was calling CQ and uh, I saw this little tiny smudge of a signal in the middle of the receive uh, period pop up. And I said, well, there's no way that's gonna decode. And sure enough, it did. It was UN9L in Kazakhstan calling me. So I worked him. Uh, Kosovo is a pretty rare country. Not everyone has worked that. And uh, when the expeditions go on there, they're very popular. And there was one who went there and did EME. Here's some other cool ones. These are some recent ones that came in. Uh, 4W8 on Timor-Leste. Uh, that was a tough one because we actually did not have uh, any common moon time until the last two days of that expedition. And uh, I managed to get them on the very last day because on the next to last day, um, uh, at their moonrise, the moon was coming up through the palm trees and uh, they couldn't get a good view at it. And there was too much uh, attenuation through the, uh, uh, through the palm trees. Uh, CY0S on Sable Island, they brought some EME gear and I was able to work them there. Um, all the rest of these are pretty cool de-expeditions and fairly rare. OJ0DX on Market Reef, there's a group there now just doing HF. Uh, a couple of summers ago, uh, they brought some EME gear and uh, I caught them just as the, as the, uh, the moon was setting on over the ocean uh, at their end. Is, is the picture on that card the actual antenna they're using on the OJ? Yeah, they, yes, that's the actual antenna they were using. The uh, the one on the left, I think it was a single 13 or 17 element Yagi on two. And on the right was their 432 antennas. I forget how many elements and how many Yagis those were. But yeah, that was just a single Yagi on, uh, um, on uh, two meters. Thanks. Um, K6MYC. Um, uh, who I worked uh, is the, he's the M of M squared. Um, he uh, is one of the pioneers in moon bounce. He's been doing it for, I think, 60 years now. Um, and it was great to work him. G4TRA over there, the card that uh, uh, I mentioned him very early on, he was the guy where, that I used as an example of a, uh, a signal trace. Um, he runs the uh, UK legal limit of 400 watts and a single 17 element Yagi with no elevation control. So he is stuck working guys only at his moonrise and his moonset. And he knows exactly where the beam of his antenna is, uh, what, the, what angles it's taking off at. So he tracks the moon very carefully to see exactly when it's at uh, seven degrees, for example. I think, I think his main lows are like seven and 14 degrees. So when, when the moon is at 14 degrees, he can work guys and then he can't work anything until the moon gets down to seven degrees, then he can work guys again. And he's worked like four or 500 initials um, with a simple station like that. Uh, the HS0 card you see down the bottom is uh, also kind of an interesting one. That's, that's a part of the world like 4W uh, where we don't have a lot of common moon time. If you think about it, only half the, moon, half, the uh, half the planet can see the moon at the same time. Uh, and there are only certain times when uh, moonrise and moonset coincide for stations that are over way over there. So here's an example I was real proud of. Uh, by, by the way, that's when when moon bouncers talk about cool stuff they've worked. It's different from HF. On HF, working DX that's very far away is the big deal. On moon bounce, everybody's at the same distance away. Um, uh, Atlanta is the same distance away on moon bounce from me here in New Hampshire as uh, HS or YB0. Everybody's a quarter million miles away. Um, so um, the, what you, what the, the real macho contacts are the ones where there's a very limited period of time 
when you both can see the moon um, or guys that have single Yagis. That's a big deal, uh, being able to work really small stations with low power and single Yagis. Um, I noticed uh, for a while that YB2 MDU in uh, Indonesia was very active on uh, two meters. So I sent him an email and asked him for a sked, um, knowing that the common moon window is a maximum of one hour during that particular month. And in most of the days, the moon was very close to the sun direction and uh, uh, was uh, not a good place for the moon to be. But he agreed to try it. And on October 11th of 2022, the moon was setting in uh, YB and it was rising um, here at uh, K1DG. So that's when we gave it a shot and we made it. Um, that's the screenshot of the contact uh, from my side. Uh, you can see that uh, I called him and uh, then, uh, or he called me, then I called him, he answered me and gave me the OOO report. Um, I sent him the RO report and uh, um, then uh, sent him, uh, he sent me the RRR reports. So that was very cool. That was, uh, I was able to check that box off and put it in the log. And you can see a signal was pretty weak, but um, you know, the, uh, the moon prediction saying that uh, uh, right there at 2336, the moon would be sort of at the right time between us. <clears throat> we completed the contact at 2336, exactly. And uh, he was so excited because he'd never worked anybody on the East Coast of the US. He'd worked a few West Coast guys, but never the East Coast he sent me screenshots of what the contact looked like at his end. Uh, he uses two different receiver chains. So over here on the left was one of his receivers that picked up my, uh, when I called him. And over here on the right side was his other receiver, which copied my RO and 73 messages. So um, uh, he was very excited and uh, put a picture of it all on Facebook and sent me emails and um, all that stuff. I'm still waiting for his QSL card. The mail service from Indonesia to here is not all that great, but eventually I'll get a card from him, I'm sure. Okay, there we go. Um, KA6U is an interesting character. Um, he uh, started EME about eight years ago, about a year or so after I did, and he built a portable station that he can deploy, when he got some practice under his belt, he could deploy it in 60 minutes. And he makes, uh, he's been making the rounds, putting uh, rare grids on the air, um, grids that can uh, don't, don't have any resident VHFers, but if he drives there, guys can work them off the moon. And uh, uh, you can see there his uh, uh, two meter array and uh, uh, that he's got set up on just a little tripod and some, uh, I, I don't know if those are uh, uh, concrete blocks or milk jugs full of sand or whatever, but um, it's just a temporary setup. Um, he had... Uh, he had been doing uh, all the bands. At one point, he had four bands running at the same time uh, every place he set up. Uh, he was on uh, two, 220, 432, and 1296. But uh, his two and 220 antennas were on uh, a big pickup truck that he had, and uh, that truck died. And uh, so now he just does 432 and 1296. Um, and I think maybe even maybe 10 gigahertz with a little fold, portable folding dicks, uh, uh, dish antenna. Um, so it doesn't take a lot. It takes some work. Um, you're not going to do it with a, a handy talkie and uh, um, the rubber duck antenna, or uh, even if you've got a multi a multi mode uh, VHF rig, you won't do it with uh, 200 feet of RG58 going out to a ground plane. Um, you you need to put a little work into it, but it's not impossible. Um, a, a perfectly adequate two meter antenna is only about 15 feet long, you know, something like an old Cushcraft uh, 11 or 13 element Yagi. Uh, they only weigh about five pounds, so you can hold them in your hand and put them on a tripod easily. Um, if you get a, a 300 watt brick uh, solid state amplifier and a short feed line, one of my neighbors here set up in his driveway with exactly that setup. Um, uh, I think he used an IC706 and a brick and an 11 element beam that he manually and visually pointed at the moon and he worked a couple of the big guns so he could check off the box and say that uh, uh, he's uh, made a moon bounce contact. Um, but if you want to, I'll, I'll warn you, once you make the first one, it's sort of like eating potato chips. It's hard to stop after the first one. You'll want more and more. And uh, you know, as, as uh, cool as my station is now with uh, four 14 element Yaggies and uh, 
mass mounted preamp and a kilowatt. I've got a list of half a dozen improvements that I could make here uh, to make the station work better. So it's, uh, you know, they say that every man needs a hobby and uh, moon bonds can be a great hobby that'll uh, uh, keep you busy for a long time if you want to keep uh, cranking away. And that's my uh, the dedicated card that I use just for moon bonds. I thought the picture was really cool looking back at the earth from the other side of the moon. And there we go. And now we're back to live. That's a really good presentation. Yeah, you, we hear a lot about EME, but I think you're the first person that's ever come and done a really good presentation on it. So uh, how many questions we got? I know Rob just itching to ask questions. Rob, yeah, I'll, 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 get, I'll get to him. Go ahead. I'll give everybody else a chance. The um, well, the when you're using do, do the radios work with separate receive and uh, transmit antennas or are you using the same one for both? I, I, I use the same one. Um, uh, sometimes I switch the polarization. I, I have another relay up on the tower that uh, switches the uh, uh, switches from the vertical elements to the horizontal elements. Um, one of the improvements I have in, in, that's planned is to bring down both the horizontal and uh, vertical feed lines in the receive path. Uh, so that I can have sort of the equivalent of diversity reception. So I can uh, detect whether guys are coming in horizontal or vertical in real time. Right now, I switch between horizontal and vertical if I have to, but it's, it's the same antenna array. Uh, building building two uh, H frames of 14 element Yagis was more than I really wanted to undertake. Just one, one was enough. Now that sounds, that sounds great. My other one uh, question is about the effect of the surface of the moon, you know, the uneven surface with the, the craters and the everything else. And, you know, does that, what kind of effect does that have on the, on the signal coming back? Well, it makes the moon a really crappy reflector. Um, you know, it's not like having a, a nice big mirror in the sky. It's like having a, a mirror that's uh, very lumpy and bent. And, uh, you know, if you, if you, if you look, at, look at your reflection in a piece of uh, a very shiny aluminum foil, and then crumple it up. Uh, you can still see your reflection is there, but you might not recognize that it's you. Um, so um, I've, what I've read is that the, uh, the amount of signal that comes back off the moon is only about 7% of what hits it, because uh, it's a, a really lousy reflector and it scatters things in all sorts of directions. Um, the, uh, the moon also wobbles a little bit, which uh, is something that's uh, detectable when you get up into the gigahertz region. Uh, you don't really see it so much on two meters, but, um, you know, the, the moon, um, if, if, you, if you look at the moon, um, you can pretty much cover it by your thumb at arm's length, which is about a degree. Um, so the moon's only about a degree wide. And even my big antennas, the four 14 element Yagis, has a beam width of about 14 degrees at the 3 dB points. So, um, you know, I'm I'm illuminating a lot more than just the moon. So a pretty small fraction of what I send up in that direction is actually hitting the moon, and a small fraction of that is coming back. So um, it's uh, it, it it's it's an interesting reflector. It's not a not a very good one, but it uh, you know with with a sensitive enough receiver and enough transmitting power, you can get a signal up and back. One of one of the cool things I found I could do once I graduated up to the 14 element array. Um, is that I can see my own echoes come back. Uh, there's an echo mode in the WSJT software where it sends a signal uh, for a couple of seconds, then it stops and it listens for the echo and it tells you how loud your echo is. And on my old antennas, I could see my own echoes once in a while, but with the big array, now I see it almost every time. Yeah, speaking of echo, there's a YouTube video out there of... Uh... It was harp. The harp was doing a test, and then the amateur re recorded that, and you heard the signal. You heard the harp transmit signal go out, and then two point four seconds later, you heard the you heard the echo. Yeah, there's, there's another really cool YouTube video. Um, I should I should probably drag out the link for it somewhere, but it was done by some guys that occasionally get access to a huge, huge dish antenna. Um, that's a, a commercial or government antenna in the Netherlands, and they put it on 432, and there's a video of a guy singing Frere Jaca to himself. So he keys a microphone, says Frere Jaca, 
then unkeys it and hears his own voice come back. So he sings with himself, uh, sings a duet off the moon. Saves it saves equipment, right? A multi track. Mm -hmm. If you if, if you look for, I think the call sign of that uh, of they use at that club station is Papa India Nine Charlie Alpha Mike P I Nine C A M. So if you Google that, you might find the uh, the, the video of them singing to themselves. That's pretty cool. I'm going to turn it over. I still have, I think I have a couple more, but I'm going to turn it over to everyone else, give them a chance. Oh, I, yeah. I, uh, go ahead. Hey, Bill. No, go ahead, Bob. Um, is it possible just to uh, monitor and hear signals on moon bounce without working anybody? Is it that oh. much activity? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, you definitely want to do that first. Uh, you want to make sure you can hear guys. Uh, uh, just like on HF, you know, you, you don't want to be the guy who transmits and can't hear anybody. So you want to make sure you can hear stuff first. And, uh, you know, the, the best steps to test out your receiving capability are first, um, look for a, a beacon station that's off at a, a pretty good distance, you know, 100 miles away, that's uh, very, very weak. And if you can see the uh, trace of that beacon uh, on the waterfall display on the software, that's a good indicator. Uh, then tune into that um, uh, French radar on 143.050, and at the right time of day, uh, when they've when when they're when the moon is in their beam, and uh, you can see the moon, uh, you'll see their trace. Looks like a, a stream of dashes, um, and uh, especially during the moon bounce contest weekends, there's a lot of activity. So, uh, yeah, you can uh, uh, just point your antenna at the moon and uh, get your receiver on the right frequency and listen, and uh, you'll be able to decode guys. Thank you. Yeah, that's kind of what I was going to ask. Is it possible to just eavesdrop? Uh, and my question, I think, sort of dovetails with, with uh, Bob's. There's a lot of activity, so even with a marginal setup, we should be able to point something at the moon and hear something, or at least have the software detect it. Uh, we had a club member several years ago, uh, KD4 uh, SGN, who used to run this software on his com his computer slash radio that would actually detect signals below the noise level? Uh, two was it two minute transmit and two minute receive based on GPS time? Um, that's the same sort of thing I believe he was doing, but he was that's, doing it. Yeah, ahead, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it, it, it's pretty similar. Um, you know, you can if you're if you've got really good ears, uh, you can hear signals that are kind of at the minus 15 dB, 15 dB below the noise in the uh, in the whole bandwidth. Um, you probably can't hear anything much weaker than that. Um, and, uh, but the uh, the software can detect it. Uh, yeah. Same thing with FT8. Sometimes there are, there are signals you can't hear, but uh, you can decode. But uh, yeah, on, on Moon Bounce, that, uh, that really opened up a whole new layer of guys at the, uh, the uh, moon bounce big guns could start to work when uh, things went to the digital modes. That's pretty cool. I, I've, I've read about it and I've heard about it, but I, like I say, you're the first guy that actually came in and, and gave us the details on it as opposed to it's possible. So this has been, this has been a good presentation and I, I'll be going through those slides a little bit later. I did screen capture a couple of them. Um, the live I've CQ got, I've screen got in particular. I yeah, I just slides. while that was going on, I just did the the one note capture, the live CQ screen, which that's that's something else that kind of piqued my interest because I saw somebody do that once before. Um, anybody got any more questions? This this has been a good presentation. Anybody got any more questions? Yeah, I've got one. Um, okay. Go ahead. When when you do a, a moon bounce, you know the moon is sometimes farther away than at other times. Um, do you, do you notice a difference in the time to get the signal back? Is it seconds or are we talking milliseconds or is that well, a good question? <laughs> oh, that, that's, that's a fair, that's a good question. It's, um, it's about 2.4 seconds um, to get a signal to the moon and back. Um, so that's the delay. Um, and uh, you can go through the arithmetic on that. The radio wave goes at 186,000 miles per second, and the moon is um, uh, uh, to the moon. The moon is about 240,000 miles away, and so two times that's so almost 500,000. So 
It's a 2.4 seconds round trip. It doesn't vary a whole lot um, uh, based on the, the, the different distance to the moon. Uh, that's only about a 10% difference. So um, it's, uh, it's about the same. I had a similar question come up once when I did this presentation. Someone said, well, you know, do you have to aim your antenna ahead of where the moon is going? Uh, <laughs> so, you know, sort of like, uh, sort of like uh, you know, if, if you're trying to shoot a duck or something, you got to aim ahead of it. Um, the moon doesn't move that fast. It kind of creeps its way across the sky. And like I said, even with four times 14 elements, my beam is that wide and the moon is only that wide and it's taking its good old sweet time moving along. Um, so uh, you, you don't, it, it's, it's not like you have, to, you have to lead it at all. So are most of the people doing this operating at full legal power or is there such a thing as QRP moon melts? <laughs> well, uh, QRP moon bounce is basically defined as about 100 watts and uh, 11 element Yagi. So it's a little different from what you might think of as QRP on HF, which might be uh, you know one watt and uh, and a long wire. Um, you you need a you, you do need some muscle to get up there and back. Um, but the way it works is. Um, you know, sort of like when you're doing QRP on HF, um, if you're trying to work a, loud, a, a guy on the other end who's got a, a big station, big antennas, quiet location, and can hear well, um, he can do most of the heavy lifting. So you don't have to be as big as he is. Uh, you can work a big guy with little station, but a little on moon bounce is sort of uh, 100 watts and uh, 11 elements. Um, and you can work. You can probably work a dozen or a couple of dozen guys with a station that big if uh, if you do it on the right days and you try to coordinate it at your uh, moonrise or moonset and uh, you know actively sked the, uh, the the big guys there and they're they really really want to work new guys so they'll be very patient and they'll hang in there as long as you're willing to keep your antenna pointed at the moon for them. Okay, thank you. Good presentation. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Uh, one other question, and now I, I won't bug you anymore. You, you're talking two meters, two meters, two meters. I heard other bands mentioned a minute ago. Is this strictly two meters, or are there other, or is like UHF involved or higher? I mean, oh, I there's, there, there's, uh, there's moon bounce activity everywhere from six meters on up through 10 gigahertz. Um, I, I chose two meters for myself because my Again, my, my original intention was to try and cross the Atlantic on two meters. I really wasn't planning on doing moon bounce. Um, that was just target practice to uh, make sure I had a station that was capable of uh, a real solid weak signal operation. Um, but uh, 432 is a very popular band, uh, 70 centimeters. Um, 220 is not real popular because it's not a band in, the other, in, in other countries. It's kind of a US only band. Um, so there's no activity in Europe because they don't have the 220 band. Um, the 1296 is is popular. Um, it's become a little more popular in, in the past couple of years because uh, uh, W2DBL has uh, started offering, or W2HRO, I guess it is, has to start has started offering these uh, uh, collapsible lightweight dish antennas for, with that uh, have a lot of gain on 1296. Uh, but 1296 radios are not as common as uh, two meter all node rigs. Um, I've seen some guys uh, manage sort of one way contacts. In other words, their signal was heard on 10 and 15 meters off the moon. Um, but uh, I don't know of any two way contacts that have been accomplished there because the antennas are just enormous. You need a huge amount of gain uh, to overcome the, uh, uh, the noise and the uh, crummy reflection off the moon. Um, so, you know, the, the best bands really uh, to, to, to get started on are uh, 2 meters, 432, and 1296. Um, most guys don't really have the technical chops to uh, do anything above that, but there's activity on 2304 and 3300 and, and uh, 5760 and 10 gigahertz. There's, there's activity on all those bands. Um, but with 2 meters, there's activity worldwide. It's a worldwide band. Um, I'm closing in on DXCC and a lot of other guys have done it. Um, so that's a good thing. I've got DXCC already on uh, 160 through six, including 60 meters. Uh, so getting DXCC on uh, two meters is uh, kind of another uh, another target I've got. 
it, you meant you meant 60 meters like five megahertz yeah yeah i've got the xcc there and work all states she said that, that's gonna yeah okay you gotta have a field to put that into that was kind of why i was asking it it seemed like the higher the frequency you go the better gain you can get off the yagi and the yagi would be smaller so you can make yeah. more, more complicated, bigger yaggies. Yep, that's right. The sixty meter stuff, by the way, was not moon bounce. That was uh, that's all terrestrial, uh, and uh, so the only band I've really done a lot of countries on moon bounce is two meters, and I've got ninety there. But uh, yeah, DXCC the the old fashioned way uh, off the ionosphere on all the other bands. That's pretty cool. A any other questions? Rob, uh, Rob usually has a bunch of them. He piles up and just. Drills yeah, I've, I've got them all, all saved up here in cards. Um, <laughs> yeah, on the uh, we know Rob. During the eclipse, the, so the moon is sitting in front of the sun on the on you know at the eclipse. Did that affect, or did it, were people trying to see if that you know if that was you know conditions were different? I guess with the sun blasting everything out behind the moon. Yeah, I don't know. I, I that's a good question that I don't know the answer to. Uh, I know the HF guys fooled around with uh, during the eclipse to see what happened on the low frequency bands, and you know, sure enough, when it got dark, it got it was like it was like nighttime propagation, um, and uh, for about so, three minutes. Yeah, so the eclipse had an effect on the low bands. I don't know if it had much of an effect on uh, um, on EME, but you know, it uh, it takes. Uh, uh, it takes two minutes to complete a contact, uh, or actually uh, more like uh, five minutes to complete a contact. So uh, there would be a chance to get kind of get one QSO in before uh, the sun noise came back again. Uh, so I'm not sure really there'd be a whole lot of benefit to messing with it, but I'm sure some guys did. They probably uh, looked at the sun noise to see what happened to it during the eclipse, and it probably went way down for, for three minutes and then uh, um, then came back. At least yeah, it, I, it, it was an interesting yeah, um, experience. I, I went up to Indiana. Was actually involved, and in, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't call it nets because it's more like, hey, we're going to be watching the eclipse. Let's get on the radio, and oh, by the way, report some data. Um, it, it, it was, it was kind of fun. I was talking to a guy in Texas, and right when the eclipse hit, let's say ninety percent or more, his signal faded way down and stayed down. I was surprised that it had short-term solar effects local like it is would have that kind of effect on local propagation i heard somebody else jump in i didn't mean to interrupt go ahead whoever it was uh yeah it's me again um i just checked out that live cq eu uh, website and i don't see any activity on it yeah there might there might not be any activity i'm not sure where the moon is right now um obviously there, there won't be any activity if uh uh, the uh, if if nobody in Europe can see the moon, um, or if today happens to be a bad day for conditions, um, and uh, I think the hmm. yeah, there's no moon out now. So I, I assume I just thought that maybe they would keep keep like old data up there, and, you know, until it refreshes. Yeah, I think it expires after a little while, um, and uh, you know, the, the there's there's. Like, like most uh, amateur radio activity, there's more activity on the weekends when people don't have to go to work. Um, and, uh, um, you know, there's more activity, obviously with moon bounces, there's, there's more activity when the moon is actually uh, visible to uh, the, especially to the Europeans. Um, looking at the chat room right now, let me see. Um, um, I just popped open the website. The moon apparently doesn't rise here until about 3 a.m. Yeah, so um, uh, the, that, that'll, that, that'll limit activity. Not a lot of people want to stay up till 3 a.m. to be uh, <laughs> on the moon. So the, uh, the Americans won't be on much, but uh, uh, let's see. There were a couple of guys on this morning at about uh, 1100 Zulu, so about 7 a.m. So um, if you look on that website uh, tomorrow morning uh, between 6 and 7 a.m., you'll probably see a bunch of guys uh, showing up. And uh, uh, as long as the moon's not right at the sun, um, a, lot of the, a lot of the big guns just don't even turn the radio on when the moon is uh, uh, in the same direction as the sun because there's too much noise and they know they won't be able to work any of the weak guys. Okay. Right. I, 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 Go ahead, Rob. 
I just keep coming to me. Um, but one thing is, is we have a guy, um, one of our guys uh, on our Friday lunches, and um, I was talking. Well, I was talking to one of the guys at our lunch, and you know, I'm trying to push moon bounce, and uh, he was totally, you know, not impressed. He said moon bounce is nothing, and he, it turned out that he designed the deep space network, and his stuff's talking to Voyager. <laughs> so, okay, okay, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna try and talk you into moon bounce. Is that Richard or Tom? Yeah, uh, Richard. Yeah, those guys have done some crazy stuff. Um, I, I also read a, a while back, a couple of years ago, a bunch of guys in Germany who had access to some university resources with a giant dish antenna um, did Venus bounce, um, <laughs> which um, was interesting because, uh, you know, it's 2.4 seconds from here, from here to the moon. It was uh, several minutes um, to Venus, um, which is way further away. And they had to really point the dish right at it. And they used some kind of coding scheme that uh, was, you know, several minutes of transmit cycle, then listen uh, for the signal and then um, use a whole lot of uh, digital signal processing to figure out if they had the signal coming back. But they were able to confirm that, yep, that was their signal bouncing back off moon. So off the moon or off uh, Venus. So, you know, it's doable, but I think, you know, I, I, if you if you look around your club, you probably have everything you need to put together a uh, a moonbound station for at least a demo for a club meeting at some point. Um, and uh, you know, there's someone there with a, a couple of beat up old yaggies uh, sitting in the backyard. Uh, someone who's got a two meter multi mode rig that they bought ten years ago and haven't used very much since then. Yep. Um, you know, there's probably someone with a with a, a 400 watt brick amplifier. Um, and uh, you know that that's that's enough hardware to get you started to work at least a couple of the big guys. I do have a two meter amplifier, but I don't think it's four hundred. I think it's it's either one sixty or two forty. Yeah, that's a little bit on the light side, but that that might work right at moonrise to work one of the big guys. Something to think about, guys. Maybe for field day, we'll have to check see what the phase of the moon is around field day. That might be fun just, just to set it up and try it. Even if it doesn't work, at least we'd say we tried. Yeah, you know, make 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 sure that uh, the moon's in the right place, and uh, uh, you know, it, it, you get on. And if you're if you can hear that French radar, that's a good starting point. If you can hear that, you can probably hear some of the big guns and uh, and uh, make contact. So I made I made a note of that one forty three oh five oh. We'll know where we'll know where to look see if if we're even receiving. Right. Doug, this is this has been a good presentation. We may reach out to you around field day or so to <laughs> get get you to laugh at us a bit, and when we tell you what we're going to try, I think I may try this, guys. Just for just set it up out there in the park and to see what we do with it. If it doesn't if it doesn't work, then at least we had fun putting it together. There you go. Yeah, we'll pop that one more. Oh, sorry. Yeah, we we send a picture to Doug, and he'll get a good laugh. He can put his presentation under a slide. Here's what you don't do. <laughs> yeah, All right, he can Doug. Use our that's an example of what not to do. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, here, here's here's one like the one on the island really caught my attention. It looks like that entity looked like something you just carry around. It it wasn't any big deal, and it, it was working. So, yep. Doug, you got anything else you want to throw in? This has been a oh, good uh, presentation. Rob, did you have another question? No, I think Bob did. He, he uh, Bob. Okay, Bob. No, I'm good. I'm good. Now, okay. These are smart guys, Doug. These are the smart guys. Here. Well, the smart guys are the ones that ask the good questions. So, yeah, that's right. all right. Well, thanks very much for inviting me. I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, maybe I'll work you guys off the moon one of these days. Well, maybe, maybe around field day sometime. We'll have to see what the phase of the moon looks like. I mean, surely working from Atlanta, New Hampshire, even though it's still a half a million miles, we could cheat with ground wave or something in there somewhere. No, 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 no. You know, it's some of the hardest. Some of the hardest states for me to work for worked all states were the close in ones because their ground wave signal uh, was so big compared to the moon bounce signal. But it took me a little while to figure out that if I catch them right at moonrise, their, their, their direct signal on ground wave is on the exact frequency they transmit, but their echo off the moon is 300 hertz away and I can tell which signal is which oh, you can and I can detect it. Gotcha. So uh, gotcha. that's, uh, that's how I managed to work all the uh, close in states. So okay, well, you, do, repeater, you don't please. count it as a contact. You don't count it as a contact. We'll we'll count it as a question. <laughs> All right, great. All right, All good right, night, guys. Thanks for the later.
four second delay to it. Go ahead. All right. All right. Talk later. Later. Yeah, just like Zoom has like a second and a half delay. All right, so don't be surprised if some of the other Atlanta clubs contact you because you know they're gonna they're gonna hear how great this was and they're gonna want to hear you themselves. Okay, cool. All right, see you later. Yeah. Night, guys. Bye bye. All right, nice. guys. We we've talked about the ham fest and we've talked about the upcoming May 13th in the park, which we will not be doing moon bounce at, I'm pretty sure. Uh, the issue with the repeater site downtown, which is probably going to be going away next year, late sometime. Uh, any other business needs to be brought up before we pull the plug on this month's meeting? Going once? We've got twice. the lunch tomorrow. Oh, no, oh yeah. Oh, yeah. There you go, Rob. Uh, a Los Bravos restaurant in Dunwoody. And I can tell you the service is good. The food has been, I won't say it's exceptional, but it's been pretty good. The service is really good. Nobody has complained about having stomach problems the day after. So I think it's going to be a permanent location for a while. They seem to like us. Uh, yeah, it's more like North Atlanta. Thanks throwing that in there. Yeah, and the info's right. on, the, on the website. Um, yeah, the info's on every, the website. Everyone's invited. All right. Anything else? Going once, twice. All right, man. We'll see y'all at lunch tomorrow. Thanks. Good night, everybody. Thanks for coming. Good night, Rob. <laughs>